record to the club. Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, afternoon session of Open Security Summit 2020. We are all excited to be here and uh, I hope we too, you too. Uh, what we expect, we expect uh, your ex uh, participation, uh, of course, mutual respect, uh, uh, care deeply and uh, just um, learn from each other. In our summit, we really respect openness, uh, so uh, sessions will be video recorded uh, and uh, even sometimes live streamed. This one is not live streamed yet, but uh, there are other sessions which, are, which have live streaming. Um, all uh, the content will be shared then in YouTube and in our official uh, summit website. Uh, if you don't want to identify it, uh, you can just uh, take some personal precautions and uh, that is up to you. So we here uh, just uh, respect each other, collaborate with each other, try to uh, help each other and uh, try to have some uh, life scenarios that will be really very useful then in your companies. And also we want to learn from you. If you can bring your experience, that, that will be also very great. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, coming and uh, please share your views in uh, uh, tweet us and uh, just be generous with uh, sharing everything uh, just uh, in LinkedIn or any other social media. Uh, uh, I will share uh, the links uh, in the chat just after this. Thank you and I'm giving the floor to our uh, speakers. So. Elvin. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess in this particular session, um, we're, we're basically going to pick up from where we left off in the last one. And, and in the last one, we were basically trying to identify how we could um, extract um, information or data from the ISG specifications, those requirements, um, and um, into, a programmatic, into, into a form that we can programmatically then um, utilize that, that information, as well as how we could also sort of generate test data to verify against those ISGs. Um, so I think that um, a few of us have actually carried out some experiments um, on how we can potentially do this. And there's some demos um, to show for, so, for it. So um, I'm, I guess I'll hand over to Vinter to kind of kickstart that. Thank you, Alvin. Um, so I'm just about to share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so following from, on from um, what we were discussing in the last uh, uh, meeting, um, we were trying to figure out, based on looking at one of the NSA's uh, documents on PNG, uh, ISG, sorry, documents on PNG, we did, we were trying to figure out how we can programmatically extract all. Uh, all this useful information on uh, the risk and recommendations. Um, so I've never done this before, but um, having a look on the web's, uh, web's uh, web and just trying to see what tools are available, I came across this one, which is quite interesting, called Textricator, if that's pronounced correctly. Um, this gives some quite useful quick starts, um, but interestingly, the, the main three sub-command options is being able to pull out um, data from forms, tables, and text. Um, here's something I tried earlier. Um, so this particular quick start is looking at um, the a PDF, and it's in a table format. And what they've managed to do is you can actually extract the information as CSVs, um, so, or you can even spit it out into JSON. And um, so, looking mm -hmm. at this, it looks quite feasible. But what, what, what I was interested in um, was this one because it seemed like it's something useful for us. And um, 
playing about with this, I wanted I was quite interested to see what we could generate from run run basically running this on on uh, our example PNG one. And um the result I got was uh, we we can extract <coughs> the information using from the PNG one, and it seems to pull out every bit of text. Um, so, so Rubin, uh, if you're showing us something, we can't see. Oh, sorry. Hang on a second. Maybe this. Can you see my screen now? We can see your screen, but not what you're showing us. I mean, right now we... Uh, if you've got two monitors, we can probably see one and not the other. Uh, I've only got one, so uh, somehow I've done it wrong. What about that one? You seen it now? Can you see my JSON file? Yes. Yeah, got it. So, so this is the JSON file that's been um, um, generated by parsing that um, RSG document. So I don't know if you can see the the uh, RSG document in front of me? Uh, no. no. Okay, it seems like I have to keep flicking. <laughs> uh, ultimately, um, I think if you just sort of roll down from that, it, that looks to me like it's disassembled the sort of down to the PDF content, doesn't it? Yeah. So, um, what I was interested in seeing was um, how much of the uh, um, If, if we look at the PNG document itself, um, when I did a search on the risk and recommendations down here, there's, there seem to be about um, 12 of these. Um, yeah, can you latch on one of those? And so yes. What we get so, after that. so, so, let me just share my uh, flick to the other screen. So, what I quick, uh, did as a out of interest was I just wrote a quick, naughty little C sharp program to just uh, consume that JSON file that was generated by that tool, and if I run it. You can see, okay, you, you, we are able to pick out twelve rec risks and recommendations. Um, you can't see anything, then. You just see your code. Are you not? What screen are you seeing? Just, your just code. your just your sample code at the moment. I think you need to sort out what we can see because it's very difficult. You say you just got one monitor. Yeah. Hold on. Well, I'm seeing part of the monitor. Hang on a second. I think what's happening is you're able to share particular um, things, not your actual, your, if you don't yeah. want to see your screen. I think, you, I think you selected an app rather than the whole screen. Yeah, you should have selected the whole screen by saying yeah. Okay, hang on a second. You should say something like screen one or something. Uh, screen, oh, okay. How about that? Yeah, that's better. Better? Yeah, that's yeah. a lot better. Ah, okay. So, so basically, I've, I've just knocked out a quick .NET uh, C Sharp app um, console app, and consuming that, you, I ca you can see that it's re read that all, read in all the uh, 9,346 9, of the um, JSON items, and if I just did a simple link query on that, and just pulled out the recommendations, it does tally up. Um, to the number of risk and recommendations on that PDF. So in essence, um, that's as far as I've got, but... It, Can you show us the JSON again, sort of from one of those lines and actually see yeah. how the content looks when you're... So basically, there's, there's the actual JSON content that's been um, produced. And if I hover over one, the, one of the number of risk Obviously, it, the, 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 the items that are ready are really raw at the moment, but it's picking out 
every 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 word basically. Yeah, I mean this program obviously goes right down to the so but the guts it, of, it, this uh, may the, uh, be something document. useful for us to be able to look into further. Um it's not the friendliest way to. No, I think it's but, it's possible. I, yep. I, I've certainly come across other tools that 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 break things down and PDF into, you know, paragraphs and sections and and tables, in a more sort of friendly way. Yeah. So, could, um, could but it actually, it could be a it could be a useful base. Yeah. So it's built on uh, something called. Uh, let me see where is it. PDF box. So I don't know if you can actually bypass this extra data and actually go straight into this using this as a. Uh, a thing, but that's where I got to. Um. That that that's that's interesting, Vin, because I was I was also playing around with a few of these tools, and I had something that produced something similar to what you've got right okay. now. Okay, shall I, I flick it over to you then? Yeah, I could share my screen, go through that. You guys see that? Cool. Um, hopefully, I'm not just sharing a nap. So, can you see my notepad as well? Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, so, yeah. So, the 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 tool I was using. No, see if I could you pull it up? Sorry. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, the tool I was using is actually um, called PDF to JSON. It's a little um, JavaScript um, module and that I found on GitHub. So um, I haven't actually got the page open right now, but basically um, it also provides you with a command line interface, which meant that I could quickly run a couple of um, sort of tests and examples of what it can do. And the output that I actually got was also similar to yours, Vin, where it was JSON and it seems to go down to the actual text snippets and give you, provide you with sort of the coordinates for each, 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 each snippet of text. Um, but that, I found that that would be quite tricky to utilize because it means you have to figure out a way to amalgamate all that text together to form something useful. Um, and then I kept on reading and they, they mentioned something about extracting it as pure raw text, which I did. And that came up this way, which seems, seems to be the entire document, all the text from that actual document. And I thought that this would actually be quite useful. So I did do a search for ri risks and recommendations. And you can see that you've actually got all of them outlined below. You don't have any of the formatting. Um, but you do have all that actual content. So we, be, we can actually grab it all. And using this with some regular expressions, I don't see why we can't produce um, any, uh, a file in any format, only, high, only kind of capturing the parts that we're actually interested in. So I found this to be quite useful. So it gives you both modes. Um, yeah. You can grab the JSON in this form, or you can just grab all the raw text if you want to. Um, well, this so looks a bit better than the one I've got because my one's far too granular. <laughs> Hmm. So, so what I was actually hoping, but I didn't, unfortunately I didn't have the time, um, was to actually combine this with um, what Steven's done and I'll let him share that with you guys in a second. Um, and that's the, the generation of test data. I was going to create a sort of a simple JSON file and try and figure out how I can map the two together. So f go from, from JSON to actually running a test. So I'd have pre, uh, predefined sets of files um, with a specific set. So in, in this case, I probably pick the PNG header example, for instance, um, and generate the file for it, run a test and kind of um, populate the same um, sort of JSON file to show you that that's the actual result, whether it passed or failed, et cetera. So I was hoping to get there, but unfortunately um, didn't have enough time to do that. Um, so that's kind of where, where I stopped. Um, so before we, we actually carry on, I think to get a kind of overall, a good picture of it all, it'd be useful for Steven to actually kind of um, share what he's, he's done so far. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah certainly. A few different things, something else I've just been looking at just now. Just also. Um, so I'll hand that over I, to you. Yep, yeah, okay. Let me just uh, sort out, right, let's see if I can make sure I share the right thing. Screen number one. Screen number one, please. I'll press the button. Nothing happened. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay. Um, see risks and recommendations at the top. Is that visible to everybody? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so I was looking at um, one thing was on um, our actual cameras, um, doing a little experiment to see how well we could use 
um, the glass wall itself to do a bit of construction of, of manipulated files. Um, this is purely for sort of testing purposes. So here, for example, um, I've taken a small PNG file. Um, I then ran it through our export mode. And that uh, produces a report and log and what have you. And in there is a zip file. And uh, I also enabled the um, the full disassembly of image files because our default is to actually just output image files in our our uh, export packages as a, as a um, as their raw format. So this is a a, um, a fully expanded export file in XML for the PNG file that you could see in the other window. Now, what I then did is I created a modified version of it. So if I open these two up, these two directories up, and good old beyond compare. Um, They've, oh, hang on, is this lying to me? No, oh, right, okay, slight confusion there. I, right, so uh, yes, I, I took that original export directory, copied it, called it modified, and I've made a copy of the, the zip file and made that the modified one. So actually what I, I should have done, um, go into the modified directory. Right, so there's two zip files in there, the original one, and the modified one. So if I compare those, you'll see there's two XML files inside there. And I went in and I edited, did a little copy and paste. So I simply took that PLTE chunk, which I think is probably at the start. I think it's sure it's the first structure in there. Okay, I'm not going to find it now. Um, let's try searching for it just to show you where it is. So it starts up there. And then I've made a, a complete copy of that structure in the XML file. I didn't do anything else with it than that. That may not be particularly valid. Well, it's been, I don't think it's meant to be valid at all. I think that was one of the first thing I was, that was the reason I did it because I saw it mentioned in um, the ISG file for it that uh, that was only ever meant to be one of those, and copied it across and then made that container file. So if I go back to here, I now have two zip files, and I then ran it back through um, Glasswall re-imported it and that still has got validation on now uh, I'll tell you why that was in a minute what I wanted to try and do was disable validation um, which I did put a switch in and prove that if I disabled validation it um, would still try and produce a file but then there's a secondary check that we we have when we try and write data back that we've proved that we have actually visited every node in our tree therefore that needs to be disabled as well and that's why I couldn't get that to work but what this shows usefully is in the report when it tried to import that bingo it threw up a, a fault from our callback code saying only one PLTE chunk and out so clearly as as expected we've uh, gone through our specifications and we put in rules that follow all the little rules and regulations and it's spotted that that imported file doesn't validate properly because that uh, extra chunk is in there that shouldn't be there. Um, now, if I got the loop right where I'd get the right to allow us to write out the corrupted file, um, I would expect us to, when we process a file with that corruption in, that you would have that same effect. This is sort of proving that at that point when the re-import re works, it's actually already running the validation on a fully reconstructed file with the mistake in it and throwing up the, the validation in there. So um, I'm quite happy that that will actually, once I get the other right validation, uh, the right check disabled, that you'll actually be able to output a file with that specific fault in it and therefore add it to your archive of 
uh, specifically modified files. So that sort of, I think, um, comfortably proves that, as we'd expect, we can use our export import formats to construct modified you know, modified files. Um, now there was a little discussion earlier today. Um, let me find uh, that we were talking about what sorts of things we could make use of. So this this came out of, of that, that um, we could, could use you know, this mechanism to generate sample data based on on rules from the ISG specifications. Um, what, uh, in order to be able to test whether we actually match one of these rules, we can actually use this as a potential mechanism for constructing maybe programmatically different tests and different faults. Um, you could also potentially use the regression tester to, to help assist that validation. Um, but there's a question mark about whether we need to necessarily even go that far if we can highlight those changes. Now that was, that came Steve, from something else. Could you just um, sorry. expand on what regression tester is first? Oh, I'm sorry, else. sorry. Yes, um, we have a tool built in house um, that carries out testing on our on our cameras on our on our system by um, taking a version of our software, taking a whole suite of test files and, and a suite of YAML files that uh, identify what those what to expect before and after, well, probably maybe just after. Um, so it will take a file that we've got a known issue in, a known piece of data that should be present uh, that indicates that there was some container that shouldn't be there, um, or there is um, something in our report that would indicate too many of a particular item is present. Uh, we run it through, our, the regression tester will run that test file through, and then we'll look at that YAML file that tells it what to look for in the output file to confirm that the necessary change and fix actually occurred. And that will be able to give us a pass or fail for, for that proof that our camera or our system uh, carried out the necessary test and that can be then run on you know, hundreds or thousands of files either against the same test sets expecting the same types of faults or uh, various different ones depending on what's been built. Um, this lends itself very nicely to doing these ISG tests because we could construct our suite of uh, files with the specific types of faults that are being looked for, make sure our system deals with them and flags up that it's actually done that particular correction or rejected the file or remedied it or whatever. Um, the regression tester will know how to look for the different types of warnings, the different types of reports and the, um, the different types of data that we specifically say that test file should have or shouldn't have depending on what, what we're actually correcting. Now, the other thing on here was a couple of ideas on what we can use or how we can use the, the ISG data. Um, we could use it um, to do a sort of an external testing suite. So we could potentially take our, 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 our system, take some test files, put them through it and have some external code that a system that checks against those um, and potentially that might be where the regression test was used, but we need some tool to take these validation uh, statements and produce the necessarily um, test files. And so if we can find something to assist us in, in automating the job of building this whole suite of test data and, and test um, scripts, um, that's one possible route. Another thing is the our own internal um, validation data and uh, callback code that does validation is likely to already do a lot of the things. For example, the little one I just showed you was an example of one of the ISG validations that was saying that particular chunk should only exist once. When I duplicated it, we already threw out an error of that nature. Um, it is quite likely that we could use that perhaps to create a, an additional suite of uh, tests that are named against um, their ISG equivalents. Um, or maybe, 
uh, another third option is you, we, we simply do a, a review and actually find all these various tests and put an initial bit of extra tag against them to say when you throw up that particular error uh, or that fault that we've already identified as belonging also in the ISG specifications, we could put some sort of tag on there to say if you throw up that DVL, that, that data validation test or that callback code, when it reports, it'll have some additional tag on it to say this belongs with or this relates to a specific ISG specification um, and the particular piece of validation or, or change that it's recommending. Therefore, we could then have a report filter that um, puts that into a subsection of our analysis reports when on, re on demand to cross check to those ISGs. So that may be one of the, the simplest solutions that we simply make use of what we've already got, put some additional data in to say this particular sanitization ID or this particular um, test belongs in that set as well. And that will potentially make it easiest to carry out some sort of automated correlation between the test sets um, from, from the ISG specifications, what we already produce, um, again, using obviously some test data that needs to go in to prove these things. Um, but that may be one approach that reduces the amount of change or the amount of work that we need to do, um, and then effectively puts this ISG compliance testing in permanently within our system that you can choose to filter out as a um, as, as a reported sequence of information if you need it. Um, and with the, the regression tester, we can run those particular tests against um, our, our defined set of, of ISG uh, set up data files that have got those, those particular issues in. Um, now there's one just little thing I, I just, just noticed though, we, we were talking uh, about um, how we do uh, how we might select and grab this data. There's there's one thing that just just jumps out at me here, and I've I've seen various things. It, it may not be as as simple as we hope. We've got very clear our our, our data validation language. Perhaps if I just bring up an example of that. Um, uh, very much takes particular identifiable structures within a file and lists a series of tests. Um, to be applied to values. Um, interestingly, I just noticed there, CRCs, we, we don't actually, it would seem, do checks against those. So that's 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 the sort of thing where these, the, uh, these reports have, you know, point things out. Sorry, I just want one, one thing, but we got stuff like this, like the validate chunk types, find the specification on the whitelist. Those are quite broad. So it's not just a simple case of that's a one-to-one -one mapping. That's that's the sort of thing that we are potentially picking up by a lot of our structural reading, for example. So you're going to, Finn, was yeah, that yeah, yeah, it's, it's Finn. Um, I was just about to say, um, I'll just backtrack to a couple of meetings uh, back. We do, I think we do do CRC checking in the rebuild, but not in our editor. Right, and okay. That yeah, so that's, that's that cool. That's the sort of thing that we need, that's, that's yeah, useful so to think. pick up on the, the, the things that uh, Rebuild has done by sort of hand-created code. And I suppose uh, uh, doing those, these IRC checks, at least on the Rebuild, we can see where we've missed it out when we've gone and on to call to uh, uh, Rebuild, uh, sorry, Editor. Yes, that is that is a good point. That, that if the testing is done as an external thing, that can be re, it can be run against rather a uh, rebuild and uh, editor. So yeah, that that that's a good point. Um, but I was I was simply sort of you know we were having discussions earlier trying to find ways to reduce the amount of work that we need to do. But that is a good point actually. And, uh, right. Um, okay, that was all I had for the moment on that. I was just cool. Um, yeah, that's just knowing my endpoint security is just pinged up, and I can't see if I find my phone <laughs> to reassign it. <laughs> Do you know what's so hilarious? What's I thought I thought it was my endpoint, and I've been trying to look for it <laughs> too close. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that, that. That's actually pretty interesting, Stephen, and, and and it's good that it actually kind of. 
theoretically it should work basically based on what you've shown there's no reason why we, we we shouldn't be able to generate test data with specific corruptions that we can then sort of publish in that repository and everyone has access to etc mm. um, and obviously you, you mentioned that some of these um, rules don't lend themselves to sort of just one-to-one -one mapping so you, so you can't validate one thing against the other some in some cases one to many right um, but the, the the next question I have is is can you hear me? I can hear. Okay, oh. cool. Yeah, hello. Yeah, sorry, it's that VPN when it it's that when it reboots it seems to uh, it seems to cut us off the network briefly. <laughs> um. So yeah, so I, I caught back into that you was you were saying about how how, how some of these don't map. Mm -hmm. Well, they map to a broader set of tests uh, and this i think this was something that the discussions were coming up the other day that we were sort of getting a bit sort of um concerned that there was this suggestion that oh you know these these are you know the bibles and we they, we might we certainly do a lot of stuff but maybe we do things slightly differently maybe more verbosely in some places um maybe not in others but it's a, it's certainly a massively worthwhile exercise but it's to try to but but this, try to do it as efficiently as possible but, and as broadly as possible but isn't this, um, as I view it, two two things going on? Uh, I think the first thing is on the our um, summit ISG. What we're trying to generate is the requirements, Jason, to pull this out as rules for anyone to consume. And then we've yep. got this other one, which is going on internally for ourselves to be able to prove that we do meet those ISG. Uh, recommendations on that requirements, Jason. Yes, uh, and and but there could be crossover where where we could you know take advantage of some some of this data to do to assist us in in those those validations. Um, but I, t I take your point that um, both rebuild and and editor uh, kind of want to be validated externally or or cross checked in some way. I think you know it's just it's just. Yeah, I, I'm just sort of concerned that you know, if we start building a huge suite of, you know, disassembly mechanisms and test data and whatever, and test rules that duplicate a lot of stuff we've already got, that that always seems a bit of a shame to do that because it becomes more more to maintain. Whereas if we can borrow things we've already got in some way, that that seems a, a more you know, a, a more uh, efficient way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, fair point. Um, but just to get on, back back on on, on course um, for this session, and and the idea was that we we kind of move move the needle slightly from the last meeting, in that we we were we were originally trying to identify how we can inst extract information, and I think with with sort of the initial experiments we've carried out, and there's probably better ways to do this stuff, um, but it, it's definitely doable and something that we could at least have a first cut fairly fairly quickly. Uh, I think Stephen, with what you've done, you've also proven that we, we should be able to generate test files um, with those specific ISG um, issues in them to allow us to again, then verify against it. Um, yes. The question now is how, how, how can we join those two together to actually form a, a sort of test suite, a test framework? How can we generate a test framework from that? So right now we've got the ability to, let's, let's, let's assume that we've got the ability to generate that, those, those test files and we've also got this the ability to extract them and, and have them in a, 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 a JSON format, for instance. Um, what do we do with it from then? I guess, I mean, the, the, the thing that was jumping, say, was jumping out of me, it was um, how well we can use it, whether, whether we can do um, very automated work. I guess it's the case of if we can get the, the JSON data to sort of formulate a database of these um, these these various tests that are where we can find similarities between them and potentially identify ones that very easily translate into some you know, things that you can test. Um, then you've got the option to sort of automate those. Um, and then you have the problem that some that are not so easy to um, map to something instantly. They then obviously need some sort of human in, input to them. Um, but maybe that's done as, as a sort of a, as a series of 
transitions that we take take the things that we can see some automated mechanism and produce something from those that are you know, some sort of rule sets that are um, easy to sort of automate from and then the other one and then what's left over needs sort of manual effort to create the necessary scripts or, or extra details in that next stage of um, extraction that then gives you a series of, of tests that you can you can process um, well now I'm wondering if this is sort of where where we need to sort of look for some sort of useful sort of framework whether whether this is a, a job for some sort of testing script environment that's that's easy to use um, or you've even I just looking at sorry I was looking at um, Yara and looking at how it can actually um, you got some examples of that of Yara yeah. yep yeah uh, well the the repo is over on um, actually I, I posted it to the slack um, you can put, um, let's see. Yeah, if you if you want to head over there and just maybe take a quick look at it, see what you think. But um, it's been used for all kinds of different um, types of pattern matching. And if you're looking for patterns, whether it's, you know, one way or the other, it's it would probably be good to be able to pass it through something like that and make it so much easier. Then all you have to do is worry about, um, hold on, let me see. Do you, want, do, you want, do you want to share your screen? Or you? Um, I actually can't share my screen at the moment. But, okay. Um, you say you pinged a link on. Um, yeah, it's on the uh, the Slack. Which. Uh, I actually put three channel? links on there. Um, here, let me let me drop it in the chat. Please all right. There we go. Yes, here in the chat there is the got link. It. So got it. Perfect. Come on there. This may make that that part of it a little bit easier. Um, Sorry, move into the other room so you don't hear my background noise. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. I, I, I mean, I'm not familiar with this, so anyone so wants to that, walk me through it. The link that you're looking at here um, shows different projects that use Yara. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically, it does pattern matching. So you can set um, certain rules and have it um, have it match according to those rules. It'd be easy enough to um, to take the things that you know that you're looking at and working with, put them in here, and then all you have to do uh, from there is basically figure out um, you know repackaging them uh, as a file with those sections removed that um, that you want to have removed or you know altered, however. Um, and you could even, you could even go into, uh, zip files with Y extend and put that on there too. Uh, it seems, this seems to be an appropriate area to look. <laughs> I think. And there are all kinds of different ways that people have used it and it's been used by i mean a lot of different yeah you can see the list right there um on the uh, awesome one whatever it is uh let's see the but it's it's filed or wait sorry uh hold on let me pull it back up yeah i mean they, they seem seem quite uh Simplistic things, perhaps not not good examples to. Uh... But it would kind of remove the the need for um, breaking it down into um, something 
you know, simpler taking the PDF and making it, you know, making it into something like, I mean, you would still, I guess, have to do that to make the rules if you wanted to simplify making the rules. Um, but then if you put, if you put them into that, the only thing that can pretty much be left um, would be repackaging it according to, according to the rules. And I mean, it's, it's not that complicated from there. You have then you have an extended, however many file types. Um, so you don't have to go over every file type um, individually yourselves. Um, it's already kind of set up to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I yeah, I'm just I'm just curious as to sort of uh, so, what sort so, of level this goes to. It, so, so just to clarify, you dealt with this. Sorry, are you speaking to me, Stephen? Uh, yes, yes. Sorry, um, Alfred, uh, you... No, vaguely familiar uh, with it, um, but just to clarify, um, basically, you th this would allow you to um, basically define all the rules that we've got for those ISGs. Obviously, we've got our, our generated test files. That's a separate thing, but this 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 then lets you plot every single one of those rules. And this will then, you can then utilize this to verify whether the, the, the existence of a particular element or items present or not, or what, depending on what your rule is. Is that correct? Correct. Cool. So Stephen, I guess a, a good way to visualize it is um, a, a probably a, a more sophisticated version of, uh, of the regression tester. Well, it sounds like the sort of thing you might want to plug into your regression tester, isn't it? Because I think that's got sort of some some search facilities isn't it but mm -hmm. this looks like something that uh, would be a useful sort of thing to bolt in there to be able to add, add more detailed rules like this i'm guessing this is sort of able to sort of hunt through looking for whole suites of different tags and and identifiers within a file and then and come back with a re and result saying if these are there in a particular order or a particular way Right, and it is rather powerful. Um, there are other um, things that people could use with it in sort of a modular fashion if they want as well, depending on how you set it up. Yep, that's... Yeah, you'd have to sort of spend a fair bit of time writing a whole bunch of different regular expressions and things probably and gluing them together to but get I'm, a similar I'm, effect. I'm thinking that we're, we, we're possibly won't be able to avoid that anyway just to generate the for instance just to generate the, the the data itself you would have to know what corruption you've got to make and go through and modify all those bits accordingly anyway um, the same thing would apply to to verification so if you got if you're going to verify that if you're going to write rules to verify that you whether you've uh, you've sort of cleaned a particular area or whether you've matched you match a particular condition you'd still have to manually go in and insert those rules um, so the steps that we kind of get for free at the moment is just the the extraction of data from from the PDF document, um, and the fact that we've got something that will actually generate that that data for us as well. But the actual um, creation um, would actually have to be manual. I don't think um, I'm I'm, try, I'm struggling to think of how we. Yeah, I mean this this is this is sort of doing sort of test searches and things, isn't it? We you, we we want something that you can actually give some sort of meaningful series of instructions to say take this file, put this stuff into it, do that to it make these changes well, and that's, it, it, be, it, be, and that's, all, it starts becoming a, pro, pro, a program as such really doesn't it mm -hmm. and in a sense that's kind of that's kind of the thing though is it it allows you um to be able to actually use so if you look uh where is it let's see i have to pull up the uh, if you look on the yara so it's awesome yara that one the, yeah um there is a way that you can actually, and I'm not suggesting using this, but there's something, an idea that I think you could take from it and use it more, um, more directly um, than this. But there is a, uh, let's see, it's in services. I noticed it saying it's inspired by awesome Python, awesome PHP, I'm suggesting it's sort of built around. And, and this, this reminds me of some things where I've done in the past where I've used, okay. for example, a Python tool called scones, which was a build tool that allowed you to do build files. But then where there was custom bits, you could just drop re regular Python in to, to deal with edge cases. Um, I'm wondering yes. if this is... So the, there is a way to actually um, more easily put in... Um, 
the rules. So let's see, um, like Yara, the Yara editor and the services here, I can, I can get that pulled up for you. Let me send it to you. Oh, well, this one here. Uh, this is just, I, I am not suggesting using this. Oh, do you, do you want to share your, you got your. It's, um, oh, I, got, I, got, I just sent it over. Oh. I'm not suggesting using it, but uh, I'm suggesting that perhaps it might give you an idea of something that would be useful. Um, and the reason I say I'm not suggesting using it is I don't know if you want to take the time really to have to put everything up in, in this sort of way. Um, but they have a uh, an editor where you can edit the rules um, rather simply and, e and easily. Um, so instead of having to rewrite everything, right, having to do all of them and go through all of them by scratch, it, you're you're editing it um, using you know something that, something of an easier platform. But if you if you set it up on your end for for a back end, for, you know the um, allows you to adjust things the way you want. I mean, it might work out better for you. I don't know. Just, just a thought, you know. I think from what uh, I was saying, Elvin was um, saying we probably, you know, if this, if this has got more sort of uh, capabilities to allow you to construct things, control things, and that may well be useful um it's difficult to quickly grasp what capabilities this it's going to take has. a little bit <laughs> yeah i mean the, the validation stuff sounds you know quite useful um and then just yeah to... i think we'd have to do a bit of but i think i think um yes yeah, trying to trying to find a way of capturing the rule creation and validation in in some sort of succinct way either partially automatically and partially hand edited um using some some available tooling would would be perhaps a you know very valuable thing to be able to do um just i mean, I mean it's been used that... by everything from sorry. it's been used by everything from like um uh, virus total to um, video triage, you know, the the forensics um, video triage with autopsy. So uh, there are a lot of different places that end up using it in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so I, I definitely think it would be something that would be um, worth it to to look over and see what you can do with. Completely agree. I think it's definitely worth exploring. Um, Something there with a Python plugin that looks of it. Yeah. Yes, I think probably probably a long explore actually with that to see what uh, what capabilities it's got. Maybe it is something where um, yeah, creating some additional plugin rules and functions and things that suit what we're doing. Maybe maybe we do extend it into something that we could use. I'm actually interested in listening to Matthew's. Um, opinion on this stuff because he's playing around with quite a lot of our testing stuff so mm. I don't know if he's got any insight into this to be honest I'm deliberately keeping quiet on this um, <laughs> basically anything that gets done can easily be built into my environments um, anything that runs on a docker container will run for me so it's not a problem in that regard okay cool um, any other suggestions on how we can kind of sort of automate this this process. So I'm actually struggling to think of ideas, to be quite honest. If we go. Whoops, where's that? I love menus that come down in your way. <laughs> I think I think it'd be useful to have someone like Dennis in a session like this, to be quite honest as well. Yeah. Where I did have a spec one of the specs somewhere. It must be on the screen. Hang on. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, so I suppose it's a case of sort of looking at some of these things and seeing how these look like things that you could automate to test from. Um, because they're quite wordy, it all depends on, on how rigorous 
these descriptions are, uh, and I think we were saying this the other day, but if, if these if these form very neat, clear descriptions, there may well be things that you can automate tests from, but it depends. Um, and it's like look, maybe, at number, look, look, look at number four. That sounds a bit uh, wishy-washy. <laughs> Chunks are found in acceptable locations. Put in a specification. Yeah, you see, uh, that that that's a bit like the other one I picked out on. That they you know, they are they are very useful statements, but they in 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 a sense are a a broad description for a a massive series of tests that likelihood you know we 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 we'd cover a lot of um i mean in that particular case that would you know that, that particular case are 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 pdd definitions that that describe the the structure of the file uh, acts as a schema that would probably fix that would, would probably deal with that by its by its nature, um, because that will expect things to be in certain places in certain orders uh, as per specification. So bingo, that probably drops out of that. But how do you prove and test that necessarily? I mean, it, you, you're, you're in, you, you can, clearly you could build a series of tests that prove, oh, I've put chunk X in the wrong place. Bingo, our, our system drops it out. Um, but that's not something that I could see any automated system being able to grab that and go, yep, I know what to do. Something like this, yes, maybe you could, but there is inter. I think the trouble is these these are these are very nice, but I think they're very human. I think they need a lot of human effort to come up with definitive um, tests. I mean, if you if you can break them down into like a and or nor zor like type of thing, it's all sorry. It little, you know the and or nor xor you can break it down into that, um, then it would be a little bit easier to uh, to see. So like the number four there, um, chunks are found in acceptable locations. Well, you're gonna have to determine what acceptable locations are for a specific type of chunk. And then, well, I mean, to find, to figure that out, you're gonna have to think about what the, what the chunk is you're working with. I mean, you're looking at um, assembly, right? So, or the binary. So you're gonna to have to look at where it's supposed to be yes. or where it's not supposed to be. And then think and or nor or zor, right? Um, so you take it and you put it, you know, is it supposed to be here? Is it supposed to be here? If it's here, is it supposed to be here too? If it's not, you know, whatever, like you do each of, you put it in each of those categories, that's what you're gonna to have to be looking for. It's gonna be, um, quite a process but you, you know that's something that you kind of have to think about if you're if you're trying to set it up like that and honestly if the machine yeah i don't know anyway but let's go well we're looking at trying how to validate this i mean our, our 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 product is designed to do this sort of thing i mean that particular example we're talking about um we can look at our definitions here i mean since the whole specs out in the world it probably doesn't matter ho wholly, but um, so for example, there, this is a sort of group with definitions here that's telling you what chunks are allowed in a certain place so that you've got you know, a file header, that chunk is only allowed there once, these ones are allowed in any order in that place, that one is allowed there, these ones are allowed optionally in this place. So, and then this end, end chunk is only allowed, oh, but it's optional, but has to be at the end. So that's the sort of mechanism we have to define these types of uh, requirements. Um, where it is. So that I feel would 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 address that particular statement because we we've, we've built that that code from or that that, that data definition from from the specification based on where it says things are meant to be. Mm, and if anything's not to the specification, doesn't it? Yes. So therefore, um, sorry, sorry, go on, Martin. No, I'm going to say it's, it, it says according to the specification, and that's exactly how the DVL has been created it's from yes. the specification. So tick box. Yes. Um, it, it's a case of, yeah, 
how you write a proof of this is somewhat tricky. Uh, it's kind of, well, you, you could build a whole suite of different um, dummy files that have got chunks in the wrong place as, as proofs in those particular cases. Um, but I think um, broad proofs of, of software I know is, 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 a, is an area of computer science that can get quite convoluted and difficult to, to deal with. But obviously, we don't really want to. What do you mean, proofs? Well, you know, getting into sort of absolute proofs that all possible conditions of, of, of fault are dealt with. Um, how many possible ways could you rearrange the chunks to be wrong? You know, <laughs> clearly billions. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so you you can't prove hundred percent. You can only go well. We looked at the spec. This is our version of the spec data. That is a definition yeah. that says it follows it. So use predicate calculus and uh, <laughs> be in a development method. Yeah. <laughs> Mathematics yeah. prove it, and you uh, get into you know that sort of realm, aren't you? But from sort of testing stuff I worked in the past, this is the sort of thing where you would potentially create a series of, like I say, partially broken things that are in, clearly incorrect as far as the specs concerned for that particular rule and prove that it works by running it through our system going, yep, we put that chunk, it's not meant to be there, it gets thrown out, two more in the other places, yep, they get thrown out. But that's, that's what I'm getting at is that these, these sorts of definitions are very uh, are, are nice definitions, but they're nice and broad. They are things that you could create a series of tests for that sort of generally prove them to be dealt with. Um, but you, you couldn't, you can't, you can't expect any nice, easy, automated well, you almost test to come out of that. That test is almost a headline for a step of subtests. In fact, yes. Saying. Yes, it is. Um, um, so it's not just a test, it's saying chunks are found in acceptable locations and then you have to have a sub list there saying how you would test each of those. Mm. I mean, others are pretty much easier. Uh, you've got there five, validate, can't really read that because of the narrow in the way, but S something, something, uh, S, RGB and RCCP chunks are not both present. That's yeah, see, that's a nice logical one that potentially yeah. you could you could do um, with the um, the scripting that uh, we were just looking at. Yeah. And um, that potentially, so if there's a marker for both of those, it's easier to see. You could say if this marker and that marker is present in the file. Um, the other one, I suppose, I suppose possibly that if you you could potentially go by ordering, maybe. You could go order of chunks if there are identifiers in there, and you could say you could look at the order. But this is um, not something that can be automated. I don't. Yeah, not not easily. Um, what if we? What about something like a like a generative adversarial network working on something like this? Uh, yeah, you have to explain that one. To because me. then it would be it would be continuously testing itself. And it would have to learn from a, a sample set to be able to test it and make the other one like it just to kind of yeah you still got to create set samples then with with the suitable errors in well let's I mean, be honest that that can't be avoided mm. yeah it's gonna have to be something but at least that way um humans aren't having to do all the heavy lifting I mean, I feel obliged to remind you the first rule of testing is that exhaustive testing is impossible. Well, yeah, that's that's kind oh, of what okay. that number four sort of dropped out, really, isn't it? It's that sort of thing. Um, some things, yeah. I mean, I mean that that those, those two are a perfect sort of example, aren't they? That you can absolutely do a perfect test for, because you can say that one is present, that's not present. It's a it's a binary test. You can you can you can prove all those out. Um, that one clearly to make it perfect proof of if you if you Come yeah on. if you want sorry go ahead no i was going to say you can't positively prove number four you can only do enough of a sample to say as far as we can see what you know um 
that sort of saturated test we are, whatever, uh, it, it, it is passes, but we, we can't have a finite number of, of tests that would satisfy that because of the fermentation, perhaps. Well, if you could break down a file into chunks and ensure that that file has every chunk, then you could programmatically shuffle all those chunks around to get every permutation of them, I suppose. Yes. How much value there would be in that, I'm not sure. But I mean, in fact, out of those, number three, actually, um, it's quite it's straightforward in principle that all those defined not to appear multiple times don't. That can be um, that could be easily done. You just find all the ones that shouldn't appear multiple times and then put them in multiple times and it's your test. Yeah, I think. Um, so it's, it's kind of not black and white, is it? No, I, I think what one thing I, something Elvin was was mentioning about sort of trying to. Sort of reduce things to their bare minimums or small items. I mean, I, I, it does sort of make me wonder about, I mean, it sort of goes back to using Miraplacid, uh, the, the tool chain we've used in the past for uh, evaluating and creating. Well, we don't really used it much for creating data, but that's part of one of its, one of its mechanisms. Um, whether we could um, create an interface into our import export mechanism to, to to simplify the job of creating structures from sort of raw class, you know, class names and structures and the data you want in them, um, such that you could produce small, not necessarily 100% valid files, but snippets that will pass and show, but fail for the particular reason you want them to fail um, as a way of validating. Stephen, I think you've just you've, you've you've actually just answered that you've just solved that problem in it, because you 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 uh, a, a second ago you you'd gone through a PNG file and sort of demonstrated those chunks. So if you've got a definition like that and you've got a DVL like that and you've got the tool sets, so example Miraplacid for yes. for instance, and as you suggest, you can just take that particular section of it. You're just verifying that particular section. It doesn't have to be a complete definition, but you could utilize Miraplacid to verify that it's in that particular sequence. Mm. Yes, because you may then be able to sort of uh, uh, script something. I mean, we could potentially make a front end to it to allow us to script it more, um, you know, more, more easily, just sort of literally some sort of, uh, well, ultimately maybe a it's your JSON file where you say, right, I want one of these, two of these, three of those underneath it, um, with the bare with the bare minimum data in them. Um, you might not even be interested in this really populating all the data, um, but it's sort of a or really sort of a subset of that sort of that XML that we're using. Um, if, in fact, maybe that is an approach we need to do because the XMLs we've got are still a little bit too large and wordy and too many tags and details in um, if we can try and refine them a bit um, and simplify the job of constructing them or like I say using using Miraplacid itself in a similar sort of way such you have a nice simple wordy description of the key elements of the file that you're interested in and have it build that from that um, that could be an approach and that would allow us to describe the minimum you need to push it through the camera to say, right, does this look like a valid file with this bit in it? And you'll go, no, it's got that, that, that's fine, but this bit's wrong and that's what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, yeah, maybe that's, that's an approach. It's a sort of, I suppose it's a bit like a unit, unit testing sort of approach, isn't it? Where you're only testing the bare minimum that you need to test. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. That's definitely a good a good point, Stephen. Mm. Yeah, and, and and of course, Miraplacid's got its SDK, so it's pro programmable. So exactly, we've we've never really stretched it very far. We built a few tools around it, but yeah, one of its one of its initial mechanisms was that you can write code to create a complete file from scratch, um, similar to like. Um, uh, the, uh, the programming framework that comes with 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 Office, where you can construct files, um, both binary and XML ones. I think mm -hmm. you can programmatically say, you know, start a document, put in two pieces of text, and this. Obviously, that will always produce you nice, perfect 
file. So that's not useful necessarily for this testing, but, um, but yeah, mirror plus it certainly will, will take a structure. And if you say, put things in the wrong order, um, it's not really going to stop you. I don't yeah. think. No. Well, well, um, <clears throat> I mean, this, this is quite specific to PNG, but one, where, where one of the things I did do was when I was using tweak PNG, you can create um, a PNG file using tweak PNG and create very bare minimal PNG files mm -hmm. that can break um, some of these rules. Right. But again, that's that's not really useful. It's very specific um, to tweak PNG. Uh, sorry, PNG mm. itself. What we do want is more something like we used to talking about, about neoplastic is more general, isn't more, it? Yeah, yeah, it's more general. Mm. It's interesting. Cool. Um, any more suggestions, ideas, thoughts? I was just thinking that if there was if we could make a standardized way of changing the language, um, that would, I mean, that would really simplify things. I was actually thinking about looking up, um, looking up to see if anyone had done that. Do you mean for the ISGs? Yeah, um, of taking language and, um, using I guess phrases but not like as complicated of phrases as what are shown on there um, but something that we could take those and break them down into um, like for instance how XOR um, is able to take a more complicated idea it's not that much more complicated but it's still more complicated than you know uh, and or nor just take something and you know how can we break it down into um so that the language actually has a meaning um composed of those things so we can actually use a description like um i don't know how to explain what i'm trying to say without without actually putting something together um are, are you suggesting something quite formal like back back form Some i think it would language. be good I think it would be good um, that way, like it would actually be useful for, for something like, um, you know, a neural network to be able to take this language and, you know, uh, parse things into different categories based on something that is a little bit more advanced perhaps than um, basically, yeah, taking the language and although you're making it simpler, it's more complex than the language that has been able to be used so far um, without it being an actual coding language. So instead of like chunks are found in acceptable locations according to specification, um, being able to take that and break it down into something that would be usable and understandable because I mean, chances are a certain language in here is going to be repeated over and over again throughout the ISGs. Um, I don't know how to even explain what I'm, what it is I'm trying to say without. I think you're talking together. about some sort of domain specific language that uh, then translates from sort of a, a very legalese description into something else. Yeah, but not necessarily legalese, like, um, like a, like a programming language, for instance, um, there, you know, there are different ways of being able to actually um, make things simpler, but to take it directly from the language versus having it be programming. I don't, do you understand what I mean? Yes. So you don't have to rewrite and reprogram things over and over again, but it can actually take it directly from the language and turn it into something it can run on or something it can it can use i think that would be that would be yeah, awesome that sounds very that sounds like the a uh, bit like the bdd which is a declarative language of sorts but it's more a declarative structure that, that then code is built from um 
which is which which is a form of DSL really. Um, I'm actually Paul. Paul, uh, Paul Burke, are you, are you on this call? Uh, I am indeed, Elvin. Cool, because I've actually got a question for you. Um, it, right. It's regarding the ISGs. How much? How much do you know about them in terms of um, how they're created and generated, etc.? Not, not nearly enough is the answer. I, I can provide very little insight. Like you, I've, I've been playing catch up with this stuff. So I'm actually wondering, um, for, for someone like Boyd, obviously he has to create these things and he's probably already got a predefined sets of data, et cetera. They've had to go through this stuff, right? And yeah. I'm, I'm actually curious, it, it could it could actually sh give us a big shortcut if we could get access to some of that stuff. Yeah, I wonder though whether these were just written by a bunch of experts getting together and pouring through the standard and using just little bits of sample files to go, that was dangerous. So I don't know whether they'll have a structured data set that we can use, but we can certainly ask him. Mm. I think it's worth asking, definitely. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, I was thinking about what Matt was saying about rearranging the chunks and getting a finite set. Um, actually, can you hear me? Uh, am I... Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking about the mathematics of that and I mean I don't know how many chunks are in ping for example but if you want if you had say 10 chunks in there and you wanted to test all the permutations of that you're talking about 3,628,800 different permutations just for 10 chunks so it, it, it increases very very quickly the more sort of data you are actually trying to rearrange here so you have to think in terms of um, just taking a subset of that three million and I, I, saying we've done enough tests here, we, we think this works. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree agree with you there, Martin. For for some, this will just take it for what it is. Um, is there's certain things that we're just not going to be able to to maybe even we won't even be able to validate some of these, and that's that's okay, mm -hmm. right? Because you'll you'll have something against that saying that look, this, it's not possible to get validation in this programmatically or. Um, or whatever, but um, and that's fine. It's actually about getting as much coverage as we possibly can, right? I did open with exhaustive testing is impossible as well. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> Everything is just best effort. Yep. It's risk mitigation. Well, no, we, you said that, but then we did say that, for example, uh, three could probably be finitely tested and five certainly. That's easy. Yeah, that's one tiny part of this massive hole. <laughs> Oh yes, but I think that just shows how how varied all of these are from one to nine in this example here. How varied where we've got finite things which we can test, and then we've got rather vague sort of spec that says you know it has to be in this order to get, and then we've got others that you know they don't appear multiple times. Um, you know, and so it's a bit different gradient gradation really of, of the tests. It's sort of a good example actually, most certainly. Mm -hmm. um and perhaps one of the first exercises you go through once you've extracted all the content from here is to actually go through each one of those and identify which ones can actually be be tested and which ones can't. So you kind of put a, a label against the ones that you're, you're going to skip over and then start focusing on that. I so, yes, that's interesting because you could actually do um, grade them as, as I've just said and we've just been discussing. Mm -hmm. Say this can be definitively tested. It's either this, this is either present or it's not or this is duplicated or it's not, et cetera. And those are finite and you can flag those as saying, we can actually test those absolutely and give you a definitive answer to say it passes or fail. Whereas others, you may, as you say, we can't do that. We have to say, we, we have to take a sample and say we're satisfied. So I think there's sort of different categories as you're saying, Elvin, to these. I think that's a star was to decide on those categories. Yeah. So can then all this stuff be used to effectively improve risk scoring files? That's actually a very interesting question. Yes, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, because you're taking a risk by saying, you know, there's so many permutations, we can't do them all, but we can test X number. But then that is a risk. It's not yeah. only that, it's also looking at the ISG as a whole and saying that um, um, depending on your coverage against this, that could kind of suggest the, the sort of risk level. So if you if you if you've sanitized a document, um, for instance, and you've um, 
covered, say, all the the testable parts of this, for example, you could actually say that you, we're, this is fairly low risk because we've been able to deal with all these points that are mentioned in the ISGs. Yeah. I think that's that's definitely definitely possible, Paul. Yeah. I think um, it's, 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 it's Finn here, Paul. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure if he was on the last um, meeting uh, just no. before stand-up. I've just pinged you a, a Google Doc that Dennis shared with us and there was some talk about the risk um, management on some of this ISG stuff. Cool. All right. Uh, and if you if you if you click on that, you'll see this. Um, the he did. There was some definition of facts on page uh, slide three, where he, we we were discussing um, the mystic, uh, risk mystifications and the risks of files and and on slide four. Uh, I think that sort of answers your question about level risks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The level risk of files, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I guess you're t t uh, thinking of this as in um, uh, sort of improving that um, sort of threat sensor side of things. Is that correct, Paul? Yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, um, progressing on what has gone into the forensic workbench right now. And, and making that whole risk assessment a more granular thing than, you know, hey, we just found some certain, you know, very limited types of active content. This gives you a whole lot more that you can apply risk scoring to it. I think once once you got to a point where you've actually got at least the majority of this, or at least some part of this automated, then there's no reason why that can't easily be done. In fact, I think it'll yeah. be quite quite a trivial exercise if you've got all the automation around it. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Cool. Anything else anyone would like to add? So I think we're kind of um, sort of running out of ideas now. Okay. We have, we have. It's been very interesting. And I think um, from, from our side, the guys at Glasswell, we're definitely going to pursue some of these suggestions and see where we get with that. Okay. Um, um, how do I get to information on perhaps the pre say the previous session which I was at? Uh, are there any of the are any supporting materials placed anywhere in particular, um, like the slides etc. That Vin was talking about? Well, they... I've just discovered. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm new to Zoom as well, and I've just recently discovered just now uh, discovered you can save the stuff in chat. So I'm hoping that once the Zoom session goes, I'll be able to still have the links to all the stuff that's been put in our chat for this session. Yes, that's uh... yeah, uh, we will, After this session, we will have a, like a recording of the session uh, published in the website and also uh, in our YouTube channel and all chat, all information will be again uh, placed in uh, in the website, uh, you can find it in the session. There should be all the links. On the website. Um, yeah. It might be worth also taking some of that um, content, if applicable, and adding it to the to, to the GitHub repository. So, for instance, the, the, the presentation you're talking about, Vin. Yes. On the bottom right of the chat, you can do save chat. I suppose that's each, each person independently doing that themselves. Um, are, are we finished with this session? Uh, maybe it's a good time to stop recording because I think we're diverting off the point. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah I just got one thing about Mira Plus. If anybody wants to sort of look at the example of that, if that's relevant to the code generation side of things, because we, we were talking about using that tool. Do you want to? reference that here or do you want to discuss that elsewhere uh, I think you can go for it Stephen yeah I mean I was just yeah. sort of digging around the found I, I was pretty sure there was some samples in the um, uh, the SDK for it that actually constructed a file from scratch within it I couldn't quite find which one it was but this one here showed an example of it um, now obviously this is quite quite a lot of extra noise with um, C sharp involved, but what I noticed there fundamentally is that it, it this particular one brings in uh, a, a B 
BDD definition for a bitmap file. And then, yeah, so uh, and there actually constructs a new one, um, which it then starts to populate with different nodes down here. We can start, they've commented it. I think it's the, oh, it's wrapping it around oddly. Um, yeah, yeah, so there's you've the, got a quick view. You've got yes, a quick view yeah. That's very short. Um, Anyway, there's, there's enough here to, to see. So there's talking about here, it's creating a new, new, st new structure, it's creating a bitmap header, and it's simply populating those, those nodes that it expects to have particular values in. Um, so it does occur to me that that is something that you could potentially uh, create, like you say, maybe a JSON file or something that you, or something similar that you define that you want a bitmap so there's the name of the header, and then what the name of the elements or the, or the structural elements you want to construct. Um, there's not a lot of naming there. There, that's maybe where it will be a slight problem. Um, but it is, it is quite. I'm trying to see if there's anything there that tells you what it's creating. No, it's very much value based, isn't it? It's, it's it's kind of it does seem to be assuming that you know the structure. So yeah, it's possible. Possible it will it will be usable or something from it. I'm not quite sure. Um, might have to look again at the, the structures it creates. Um, but it certainly had, I, I certainly recall it having named elements within the BDD. So possibly um, maybe a way of creating something that, that uses the text of the BDD to allow you to create a, a structure of, of named elements that you want and what fields you want populated. Uh, say or the, or the other alternatives, we we use our own import framework. Um, but I, I think this one might be might have less overhead on it. But there's certainly certainly the facility to construct a file from scratch or or, or a snippet thereof. Okay. Um, so yes, maybe maybe we can um, make use of this framework somehow to do that sort of tool. But uh, that's a that's a research project in itself, I think. Oh well, I I I think um, I think you've probably volunteered yourself for a little exception. Yeah, it sounds that way. Exception, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the point of it, the way I see it, is if if we carry out these tiny, these small experiments, even if they're not the complete thing, it kind of gives us confidence that we can actually move it forward, and it's it's actually certain things are actually doable, and we kind of eliminate other ideas. Um, and sort of come to, to a point where we've got um, a solid set of tools that we can potentially use to actually get what we're trying to achieve. Mm. Yes. Cool. Cool. I think that's everything. Um, so if there is no comments, questions, uh, really very impressive and productive discussion. Thank you everyone for joining and um, I think uh, Denis will be very happy and uh, he will uh, feel bad that he was not in the session but uh, probably he will request new session <laughs> so you will need to okay. do he it. He can watch the video, video can't he? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. thank you again. Uh, just uh, to remind that um, uh, tomorrow we are continuing uh, our uh, summit and uh, we have nice uh, schedule again as usual uh, you please uh, join and um, any sessions or if uh, uh, you can join from hey summit website or just from our site clicking it for it we are starting with free modeling and then there are uh, secrets and credential scanning lab and, uh, Tomorrow there will be again a session about ISG. So uh, uh, you uh, you have uh, again a session tomorrow, Elvin Win. So might be uh, that time Denise will be with us. So then we have board lay mapping. And am I right? Yep. Yep. So uh, yes, uh, these are our sessions for tomorrow. Please, uh, please uh, uh, stay active with good mood, with good spirit and join us all the time. Uh, share with your friends, colleagues, whoever can uh, be interested because here we are to learn from each other and share our knowledge base. So really thank you very much. And uh, if nothing else, uh, 
yeah, one more thing. Uh, usually in the summit, you will see the recordings um, here. Yeah, here I was oh, prepared. That, that is there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yes. Um, you can then play our recordings from our sessions and also chats will be available for you. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> ending uh, uh, then it, <laughs> ending the sharing oh, thank you